Hello, I'm Jim McCann here at ShopSmith, Dayton, Ohio, our world headquarters. Today I'm here to show you how to install the new PowerPro Gen 2 touchscreen and all the components that go with it. Now, I've accumulated my tools here ahead of time. You should do the same. And we're going to focus on this 1987 headstock here but I'm also going to show you the differences in the gold headstock and the green headstock from the early 50s. The gold headstock is from the late 50s, early 60s. So to begin with, uh, take a quick inventory of all your components, motor, power supply, cord, mounting bracket, wires, Thermal overload protector, fuse, the two belts, dry sleeve assembly, idler shaft. You'll have two switches, you'll only use one, and drill guide and various hardware pieces. You'll also have owner's manual and new labels for the, uh, for the headstock. In the owner's manual are several templates, you'll cut them out and uh, use them for drill positions. Uh, your tools, uh, everything from hand drill to scissors to clamps, rag, drill bits, files, tape, uh, it's all listed in your owner's manual. So get ready, this will take a few hours, um, but uh, what you'll have when you get done will be nothing short of amazing. Let's get started. I'm back. Now, let's talk safety. Um, short sleeves, safety glasses, takeoff rings, watches, uh, anything that can be caught in uh, rotating tools. You'll be doing some drilling, some light machining. Uh, you may throw a chip. Um, you definitely want to have safety glasses on. Uh, you don't want anything that would get caught in that drill bit. So, Sleeves rolled up if you have long sleeves on, rolled up above your elbow. Short sleeve shirt like this is preferred, uh, is the best, uh, best way to go. Now, uh, for terminology, we have two, uh, we have three headstock styles. Um, we simply call them A, B, and C. A headstock is the green headstock made in the uh, starting in 1953 uh, to um, 1957. Um, for those four years, we had a green headstock. Then they went to uh, the um, gold headstock um, as kind of an anniversary headstock, about five years. This um, Green headstock the first year was very heavy sand cast. Um, some of you uh, may have these. Uh, they don't have an access opening in the back, even though there's a logo plate. The gold headstock started with the access plate in the back. I've got drilling templates mounted on these uh, for later on. Uh, so this is the A headstock, the gold headstock, and this gray headstock or B headstocks. They've got the switch in the middle directly over the speed dial. You can see it here a little bit closer. Now the C headstock has the switch offset from the dial and has a, instead of a snap-in logo cover on the back, it's screwed on and pivots up out of the way when you need access. So those are the three type of headstocks. A for the green, B for gold and gray, and then C, this started about 1985 um, with the 510 um, system, the larger table system. So I'll put these away and we'll get going on taking apart that headstock. In your owner's manual, you were instructed to make a few pieces of wood uh, make or find um, 
This is uh, roughly a one by three. This is a piece of plywood about a, a foot wide and a foot and a half long. Uh, you're going to need a scrap stick. This could be a paint paddle. This happens to be just a cut off piece of a two by four. And you'll need an inch and a half thick block that is big enough to sit the motor on. So if you haven't already made those, we're going to use, start using those shortly now. So go get them, go make them. You, you can't make them after you begin to take the headstock apart. So let's do that first. Okay, got all those pieces made, good. Now, um, your, your headstock is pretty heavy right now. And we're gonna take the motor off at the bottom. And um, to do that, We'll set the motor on this piece of plywood on the bench tubes. We also use the table as a jack uh, to raise the way tubes up and support the headstock. Now, another safety thing, uh, we're going to unplug the machine here in a little bit and keep it unplugged for the rest of this process. The first thing we need to do before we unplug it is to turn the speed dial all the way up to fast. That'll loosen the drive belt inside and make it easier to disconnect that. Now that's the last time you'll be running it, so unplug it, wire out of the way. Now we're going to Take apart the headstock. It's pretty heavy right now, so I'll show you how to take the motor off before we lift everything. The uh, board under the table post is your jack. So loosen the headrest lock, lower the table post, give it a little help lifting, and tighten that down. You need enough room in here for your Allen wrench, and that will provide enough room for the headstock to slide off eventually. Now, to start with, I want to remove the belt cover and the, um, the weight tube tie bar here. So the Allen wrench will take that off. There's two set screws underneath. So loosen those set screws. Now, if you've had, if you've never had this taken off before, you're gonna have to tap it right here in the middle. And that'll bring it off. Set that aside. I've got a uh, driver tip for my drill, real handy Phillips screwdriver. You can use a standard type of screwdriver. Um, I like the drill driver, it's fast for disassembly. I don't use it a lot for reassembly. I tend to make a mess of things when I do and get too aggressive about it. Now, in order to take the motor apart, I have to take these screws off. That's what this board is for. This piece of plywood. That's on the bench. And then you can lower the machine down onto the, the top of that plywood. That will support the motor while you, uh, while you take the screws out. First thing though is to disconnect the wires on the switch. Now if you got an old A headstock, the green one, 
your switch and wires are connected together with screws. So it's a little more difficult to get it apart. Uh, you have to take the switch out. You need a 916 deep well socket to get onto the nut right here. And you can loosen that nut. You can reach in and help the nut loosen by spinning or rotating the body of the switch. So that's how to take it out of the, uh, the green, green headstock. There, now I've just unplugged the wires to the switch. Depending on the vintage, you'll either have two wires or four. It's not critical. You're not gonna use the switch again. You're not gonna use the wires again. We've got all that as new equipment with your upgrade kit. So next thing is to take the screws off of the, well, next thing, is to take the belt off. Now, you get your fingers into the motor sheave and pull it out. Then you can pull the belt over the edge of the sheave and it comes right off. Lift that right up into the headstock, it's out of your way. The, um, there's a wire clip inside it goes over the end of the control sheave. It hooks to the speed control. Get your thumb in there, push that spring down. Use your fingers to move the clip forward. That, that loosens the control sheave and disconnects everything inside. So we'll take the motor off. Save these screws. You'll need them when we come back to get uh, when we put it back together. That reminds me, I have a little metal tin. I've got a magnet. I put the screws in that. The magnet helps hold the screws into the tin. and all the keeper screws won't spill out. One screw right up here in the middle is often forgotten. The screwdriver is a little bit shorter. And stubby screwdriver. loose then we can raise the machine up far enough to get the motor out now you won't be using the motor again but you will be using the motor pan and your headstock will slide right off now And it only weighs a few pounds. Most of the weight is in the uh, in the motor. We're going to need to take the speed control off, and that's done with just three thirty seconds Allen wrench. Need a little flashlight with your speed control. In this position, right next to the handle is a, is a notch in the speed control. If you look down inside that notch, you'll see the Allen wrench, or the Allen screw, the set screw. 
That one's pretty tight. Let me get a pair of pliers on it. There it is. Unscrew that. Now one of the things on the list that may have seemed kind of strange is trash can. There's, you're going to create a lot of trash here. You'll never use this again. Throw that in the trash. These screws on your speed control come off with a slot screwdriver. Um, the older machines had slots here. Uh, newer machines have Phillips. Um, this one was a 1987 machine, so it's got slots in it. These items will not be used again. These are going to be replaced by electronics. So these two can go in the trash. Now I'm going to reach inside here and take the switch out. Belts in my way. I'll get the switch later, I think. The um, inside of this is pretty dirty. It has Control sheave. We'll be using that. Now, I am going to use the belt cover. This will be my holding fixture. One of the things in your list is a couple of old towels. They're going to protect the belt cover from the headstock and the headstock from the belt cover. There's also a piece of cardboard on your list. That's to go under the belt cover and protect it as well. When, when we do the drilling, we'll be sliding this around. We want to slide it on the cardboard and the um, chips will slide under it. I'm going to turn that so that the, the edges kind of turn up for that reason. Now your whole pinion shaft goes across the narrowest part of the headstock, or I mean the narrowest part of the belt cover. You can see it here. That gives you a stable work surface. So next thing we're going to take out is the um, control sheave and poly V belt. Uh, before we talked about using flashlight to look down in that hole, this is one of my favorites. That's the headlight. It puts nice light inside the headstock. You can see exactly what's going on and hands-free that way. Now, I want to get this out of the way before we proceed with the inside of this. So. Let's take the motor out, flip it over. You'll need a number three screwdriver. That's a very large one. If you try a number two on these, they tend to slip and you won't be using the screws again. So we're not worried about ruining the screws. It's just all about getting them loose when it's the right tool to use. So those are more trash. Now we need to get this wire out and string relief. Slip draw pliers are a very good tool for this. You just squeeze it the long direction of the strain relief and it pops right out of the hole. 
Again, more trash because you got a new one. Now, the wire comes loose. The last thing to take apart is the ground wire. You need a slot screwdriver, small slot screwdriver for that, or a, I've got a 316 slot driver. Also works perfectly for it. And uh, side cutters, diagonal cutters will do that very well. More trash. Unplug the connections. Throw the wire away. Well, now we'll save the motor pan for later. Put the motor next to the trash can. Now, <clears throat> to take out the um, control sheave and idler shaft, need an Allen wrench. The older um, green and gold headstocks, you, need, uh, you would use the 532nd Allen wrench for the newer models after uh, 72. We use a, a large Allen wrench, quarter inch size. Now, you also have to remove this Phillips screw down below. Yeah, that one's an old slot screw. I know I have a slot screw over here somewhere. Not a real fan of slot screws. Now the way this comes apart, the eccentric slides one way and the uh, idler shaft slides the other. Make sure it's good and loose. Now we've still got belt tension on it in here um, from the idler shaft being turned. So we leave the belt tension and you can see everything loosen up. Give it a little pry on the inside. Don't have to worry about damaging the idler shaft or the eccentric. You've got a new one of both. So that one is trash. That's trash. Now on the older machines, um, when this one was new, in the thick spot right here, there was a set screw. That set screw went into a groove in this bearing. Instead of having two bearings here, it was one solid uh, water pump bearing. That set screw held the, uh, the point of that set screw held the eccentric onto that bearing. 
So before you can get this out, when you rotate it and loosen the, uh, remove the tension, that set screw will be visible right through here. You'll be able to get to it with your 532nd Allen wrench. So those go in the trunk. Now, next thing we'll do is remove the quill and drive the wave assembly. This has the fillers in it. Nice little slide screwdriver or a punch. On, on this one, this is lead. And you can just work it from the, from the edges to the center and it loosens that lead pellet up. And it should, famous last words, pop out as a complete uh, little lead pellet. Not going to need that. And now you can loosen your Allen screw. Now this screw is an important screw. It guides and controls your quill. It's got a special tip on it. That tip is called a dog point. It, um, it's actually a half dog point to get truly technical, but that's what slides in and out on the groove in, your, in the top of your quill. And that keeps the quill from rotating while you're working. I wanna remove this so it's easier to assemble later on. You can look down into the hole. So I'm gonna put that with the key screws in that container. So to remove the quill, uh, we're going to extend it all the way and take it out. But the quill is also our tool for pressing out the uh, drive sleeve assembly. Uh, to get to that drive sleeve assembly, There it goes. You can see how this just uncoils out of the groove in the headstock. And under my thumb, you can see how that uh, tip has a notch in it that lets you get the screwdriver under it. Now that's, that's a saver. Put it in the save pile. <laughs> Now, on some of the um, earliest machines, this is very difficult to remove. Um, that's why I have the heat gun over here. Um, if, if it's difficult, they had very close fitting tolerances between the, um, between the casting and the dry slate assembly and uh, made them uh, a tight fit and they last forever that way but they're difficult to take apart now we're going to this one i don't believe it's going to be that tight but when you do have a tight one like that let me finish that statement use the heat gun to heat the casting up here just around the bearing in this area being careful not to damage the paint. You just want to heat the casting. You can heat underneath it. Um, you can get inside the headstock. What that does is the casting expands ever so slightly. And then you're able to move um, because the casting is expanded, larger hole, uh, you'll be able to slide the uh, drive sleeve assembly out.
Now we're going to try to use the quill to do the same thing. The quill will guide the drive sleeve assembly. But this is what this little um, this little scrap piece of wood is for. Extend the quill all the way and it creates a gap right down here. And then you can start the quill back and then push with it. Hopefully get it to slide out. Try a little persuasion. We've got a new quill, new drive sleeve assembly. There it goes. So we won't be damaging any bearings because we won't be using these over again. I'm going to let the quill go all the way back in there, act as a guide, and push it right out. Again, more trash. Your quill will come out. Two last things to take out. One is the switch. I'm going to just rotate from the inside to get that to come loose. Help it with needle nose pliers. As I said before, 916 deep well socket will work. Now you're going to be putting in a new, a new switch. There it goes. You'll have a new nut. Now that Star Washer, that's a keeper. Um, your old nuts on your old switch, those can go in the trash. This washer underneath there is a keeper. Now. Some of the older styles, um, and this one has been upgraded. This is right at the uh, transition. Um, they had a nut that had slots across the switch body. So you just use your slot screwdriver, small slot screwdriver like this one. And now the switch is out, this little wire spring can come out you need your needle nose pliers there it is again not a keeper last thing is to take the wedge locks out you'll notice on your wedge lock your headstock lock that it's held in place with a pin that pin will be flush on one side and recessed on the other side. The early headstocks like the, the Gilmer, the Goldie, I think, I think it was just the first year, maybe the first and second year of the Gilmer had um, this pin was not drilled all the way through, so you can't knock it out from the back side. Those headstocks, you need to use your locking jaw pliers, grab a hold of the uh, lock rod real good, and use your hacksaw to cut it. Then it comes apart. If your wedges are not worn terribly, you can use them again. You'll need to buy a new um, lock rod. We, we sell the lock rod and handle together so that the pins always line up. But uh, sorry for that inconvenience. I was early machines. They 
uh, have figured out the error in those ways uh, a long time ago. So now notice there's about three sixteenths of an inch play here. This is almost loose. When when you get the uh, wedge lock tight against the handle, then it pulls the wedges all the way to the outside. We recessed a little bit in here on this side. This is what we're going to look for when we put it all back together again. But right now, I'm going to take it apart. I've got it locked up, so to speak, so that um, I've got some stability here. I've got an eighth inch pin punch and we'll knock the pin up. Rotate the pin punch and tap it. And when you feel that pin punch start to get tight in the hole, stop. Or when the pin falls out, stop. <laughs> don't wanna don't wanna jam the pin punch into the hole and get it stuck. Now we'll use the locking pliers again. Now this is a left hand thread. So you're gonna loosen it backwards, so to speak. And now, just unthread the wedges. If you, if you hold one wedge and, and help it in, you're pushing the other wedge against the casting and they're both moving the same distance at the same time. Depending on the level of maintenance and all inside your headstock, dust and dirt, you may need to take a, a stiff bristle brush and, and clean the, the threads off in here. But eventually that will come out. I always like to put the handle back on and put the pin in the keep pile. There it is. The next topic is drilling templates. And then we'll be drilling. I have A headstock, B headstock, C headstock. The headstock we're working on It's also a B head stock. Okay, just like the gold. Three different drilling templates. These on the back are for the new fuse and thermal overload protector. So um, the fuse prevents incoming surges from getting to the electronics, and the thermal overload protector keeps the motor and electronics from overheating. Uh, the electronics also have a uh, overheat um, fail safe in them as well. But um, we're going to drill these two holes in the in our B headstock. Each of the templates are labeled for uh, either A, B, or C. This is C, B, and A. It also says for the A for the green headstock, B for gold or gray, and then C headstock is only a gray headstock. You see they fit around the openings for the logo on the access cover. They also fit around where your depth stop goes, and then they line up with the belt cover. Um, step in the casting uh, so that, that that squares everything up um, so that those holes are positioned properly. You've also got uh, this drilling template. Uh, this goes on the front of the headstock and we'll get in more detail 
in a little bit. It gets taped down. These two smaller drawing templates are used back here on both the front and the back for drilling power supply mounting holes. That's what the last one I showed you was. And the final drilling template is for the motor pan new strain relief position. Now the first job at hand is, I'm going to do the worst part first. We've got to open up this hole to three quarter inch diameter. That's what this template is for right here. Center the cutout that you've made over that hole. <clears throat> Mark that hole with a grease pencil. And you're going to clear out everything that's inside that hole right there. Now, this is probably the most complained about operation of this upgrade. For those of you who have upgraded previously, you won't have to do this. Um, but for you new upgrades, um, this will uh, this will have to be done. A couple of different ways of doing it. The original video I showed using the rectal file, and filing and filing and filing. Um, heard a lot of people complaining about that because it's a lot of work, even with a clamp holding it in place. You can use a large C clamp with a block of wood. You want to clamp it on the closed side so you don't distort the motor pan. And that that lets you get in here and work at it pretty hard. That's really the, the safest way to do it. Um, now, drilling is another option. We can start with a 3 8 inch drill bit and drill down through there. This takes um, a little finesse. We need to put some oil on the steel on the drill bit. Oh, got a little overdone there. That's why we have a ray. And this, this catches, be aware that, that when it catches, this is going to try to twist around. It'll hit you in the ribs. So either stand clear or hold it against the ribs so that you are supporting the drill bit and drill. Drill at a slow speed and it'll be, um, it'll go through and it always catches right at the end but you can control it better. And you saw that catch. I was ready for it and I, I pulled up against it and it went through. Now that's the largest drill bit I can put into this drill. Uh, the, um, another option that a customer sent me was to cut off the rat tail file and put that in the drill. And that, that file out the um, out the hole with a little side force against that. That's okay too. Um, this is one of the best solutions I've found. It's a step drill. It goes from quarter inch at the bottom to three quarter inch at the top in 16th inch increments. Now, later on for the um, fuse and thermal overload protector, we're gonna have to drill a 7 16 hole and a half inch hole. 
they're both on this step drill. We sell this step drill at Chopsmith in your owner's manual, it's part number. It's listed with the, um, it's listed with the tools that you're gonna need so that you may have already bought it. If you haven't bought it by now, um, it's, a, it's a good investment. Now it's marked for the diameters here, but you can't see those when it's spinning. So a couple of ways to keep from over drilling. I mean, with this hole, we're going all the way through to three quarters. But on these holes, you, know, you need to stop at a certain step. And when I get to those, I'll discuss that. Now this also takes oil on the drill. And it does catch a little bit as it drills through, but the, the clamp keeps from flinging the motor pan around. There it goes. One step at a time. pretty quick, relatively painless, because I was, I was expecting it to catch when it was catching as it goes through each step. Now this is kind of a, a good trial for what you're going to be doing on the front of the headstock. Now, if you don't have a large clamp like that, you might have to use your neighbor or your brother or your wife or your muscular son, grandson. Now, that leaves a pretty nice burr-free hole on this side and just a little bit of a burr on the inside. We can take that rat tail file. And get rid of the sharpness. Now you don't want to file away too much of that bar. You want a square edge for the strain relief to catch. That um, the little shoulder on the strain relief relies on a sharp edge. So that's that's done, ready to go. Now we're drilling for motor mounting and power supply mount. Now I'm going to tear off a few pieces of masking tape. The first template on the front here takes a couple of long pieces and a couple of short pieces. If you cut it out just right, following the dotted lines all the way around, the template fits right up underneath the quill opening and folds down um, around the rib running up and down the center of the headstock. So put the first tape along the long sides. That will help the template follow the contour. And then at the bottom, push in right on the uh, hole you're going to drill and then put the last piece of tape to 
hold that part of the template in. So the split here makes room for the rib. The other rib goes right up the middle, lines up right there. And you've got two center holes. I've got center punch and hammer. Give it a good smack. Leave a good center point. That'll make drilling easier when you get to that. Now, so I don't lose it, I use that china marker and put a yellow circle around it. Now, these templates, that says front template, but we're looking at the back or the rear of the headstock. And this says rear template. Now, if you notice, if you turn it this way, it lines up easily with the hole that's already drilled there, has a tenement clip in it. Uh, and I need a short piece of tape. <clears throat> Stuck to the template. Now you can use the center punch and make a hole in the rear hole and then that lines the template up with the holes very nicely. And then a good smack on the center punch. Pull the template down. The yellow grease pencil shows up nicely. Red will probably show up better or black on the goldie, but yellow works good on the green also. I'm just going to leave that one on there so that I don't use it twice. I wouldn't do that. Front template is backwards. See, these, these holes are centered in this flat section right here. One piece of tape. Use my punch to center the hole. Now, that little divot from the center punch, you're going to be able to feel it with the drill. And the drill bit will fit right, will start right in that hole. And center everything up nicely. So this is ready to drill. You've received two drill bits and a drilling fixture. This is for drilling the motor mount holes in the casting. And this drill bit matches that uh, drilling drill guide. So it's a small drill bit you need for these holes. It's clearance for the mounting screws for the um, power supply installation. I like to drill aluminum with a little drop of oil. Some people prefer to drill it dry. I think it grabs a little bit more when it's dry, but that's my opinion. I've got this set on the slow speed so that we get nice slow turning of the bit, get nice shavings, don't get powder, and you can feel it 
as it starts to go through and uh, you can let up on the pressure just that easy for two two holes A little elbow grease the grease pencil comes right off Feel for that is the center point. Little fading coming off. Perfect. And one more hole over here. There it goes, two. All right. So, those are the holes to mount the power supply inside the headstock. Get rid of a few drops of oil and the shavings inside. Now we're going to Use the drill guide next on the headstock and keep from marring the belt cover. Now, this drill guide is made to go on just one way. We need to take off these Tinnerman clips if they haven't come off already. There you go in the keep pile. Now you're going to be drilling holes in this part of the casting right here. The, these pins, these two that my thumbs are on, go into the holes where I just removed the Tinnerman clips. This pin goes over the top and this pin goes in this recess right here. That way it only goes on the headstock one way. To put it on the other side over here to drill, it doesn't get flipped over, it just gets moved over. See how that works? And then it, these guide pins go through the existing holes. Now, on there's a couple of little things that you need to understand about the old headstocks. The green headstock, the A headstock, did not have the, does not have the openings in the corner here. So you have to be even more careful because you have to knock this pin out using the same pin punch you used to take the um, wedge locks out of the headstock, knock this pin, pun, this pin out. That will let you line up with these holes and install the pins in the holes for drilling this A headstock. Now, the, some of the early A headstocks did not use Timberman clips, but relied on self-threading screws and so these screw holes will be too small for the pins to go through and you'll need to open them up with your, um, with your drill. On the gold headstock, and this one was one I recovered because of shipping damage, the, um, the holes for mounting the motor pan were off a little bit compared to the way we do them now compared to the drill guide and you need to 
open them up long ways this way a little bit sometimes and it's not every one of them this one looks like it's going to fit but you need to open those up don't be afraid to do that just give it a wiggle this way the base of the drill bit so you don't break off the tip and you can you can carve out a little extra length on those holes to make the drill guide fit so on this one and on most of them you're going to need two c clamps these c clamps have to be a two inch c clamp won't quite go deep enough these are three inch c clamp well this one's a two and a half inch c clamp that's the throat opening this is a three inch but they've got a deeper throat opening and they let you get down all the way to the uh, the thick part of the casting with the clamp now clamp it the way I've got it here with the handle of the clamp on the inside now you can see this pin is in the opening that pins in the hole that pins above the casting and that pins in a hole perfect a little bit larger bit 930 seconds now I'm going to lay this on the side so I can get a little bit better drive down I'm being supported by the bench I don't have to um, I don't have to muscle it quite so much. Put a drop of oil in the hole. It also works better this way. Oil a bit and Away we go. So I'm getting nice little shavings coming out. Put the handle of the drill bit against my chest. There it goes. I'll try to let up on my pressure just as it starts to go through to avoid that grab and dig. Maybe a little oil down in the pocket will help also. There it goes. Still pulled me down, but now just have to do the same thing on the other side. See, clamps come off. The fixture moves over to the other side. And again, if you're on the green headstock, make sure that the open hole is next to the quill hole both times or you'll, you will have ruined the headstock. Because you'll drill the holes out of position and The out of position position is close enough to the right position that you don't get good holes the second time. That's an expensive mistake. Move that over. Now, hear those shavings grinding against the cardboard instead of the 
belt cover, it's a good move. So, we're going to drill these three holes. Taking all the time to paint your headstock and then you scratch it up on some shavings. Not going to be happy with yourself. All right. Second time around should go easier than the first. One in a row. There it goes. the six motor mounting holes and the four power supply mounting holes and the one hole for the new strain relief, the new machining for the uh, fuse and overload protector is yet to be done. That's this template. This is for the B headstock or the gray head, gray and green headstock. It's got the removable logo cover and the switch in the middle. So we need five small pieces of tape. the features, this with the recess, this with this recess, and this down the belt cover line. All right, first piece of tape on top. It does the most to overcome gravity. Center punch and hammer. Now these open up to the half inch and seven sixteenths diameter. We're going to use this step drill. You can use half inch drill, 7 16 drill uh, from, your, from your drill index. You uh, need a bigger check than the one I've got on this drill. And um, it will grab as it goes through, especially the, uh, the last larger drill bit. Um, so drill a pilot hole about a quarter inch first. That will center the large drill bit in the hole. And then uh, drill with the final size, either half inch or seven sixteenths. I'm going to show using this uh, new step drill. The biggest problem with the step drill is not going too deep. And couple of ways that you can mark it 
Uh, one is with tape, the other is this grease pencil. Um, the smallest hole is 7 16 So if I mark that 7 16 hole with the grease pencil, when I go through that, the grease pencil will disappear. And then I'll mark that again with the, um, when I go to drill the second half inch hole. Now I'm gonna leave the template right down here so I don't drill the wrong hole, wrong size hole in the wrong spot. If you're drilling a 7 16 first, you could drill either one of them and be all right. Now the other way to, to mark the step drill is with tape. Um, it takes a, a narrow strip of tape. And if I'm if I'm drilling the 7 16 hole, I'm going to put the tape on the half inch step. That way I know I stop at the tape. And then I'll take the tape off and put on another piece for the, um, for the half inch hole. So there's two ways of doing it, both on the same drill bit. This cuts very well on aluminum. Seven sixteenths hole is over here. Starts with a quarter inch pilot. That, that tip on there is just like tip on a regular drill bit. I can see them. Now you can see them. Now it's, it seems easiest to me to pull this towards me. And I'm, I'm also machining it dry with this step bit. Now I'm gonna turn it sideways like this and you can see better what's going on. You want to go through the stud, it, it jerks a little bit but it's not terrible. Now this is the 715 size. Now that's cut nicely, burr free. I stopped at the tape. I wiped off the yellow uh, grease pencil. So I'll put another piece of tape on. There's my tape. that on the 916 step and don't go there. Now this is the last step. As you go through, it will just chamfer that edge real nice. Now you want to hold the drill perpendicular to this face. You don't want to go in at an angle like this or that, this way or this way. So it does take a bit of a skilled hand to 
accomplish all that, but I know you all can do that. Your shop's in the right? Okay, so that's that's dandy new tool we've got available for this upgrade. So now we're done with the drill. Just have to clean up a little bit. Finally, the last thing to come out is going to be the quill feed pinion shaft. Now, that's held in with a set screw that's under this putty right here. Um, I'll have to dig that out with a scratch hole. This one's old enough. It looks like they used a, a body putty filler. Some of the newer ones have a lead pellet in here that you can pick out with just a screwdriver or sharp pointed object like this, a scratch hole, um, ice pick, that kind of item. You need to dig out all the all the filler from inside the set screw so that your Allen wrench will, will fit in there and, and loosen it. Probably be a good idea to loosen that lock right now because the, you're going to need to use these parts on your new uh, quill feed shaft. The quill feed shaft is a little bit longer and makes up for the extra room required for the new touch screen. So take off the handle and the washer and release the stock and slowly unwind the tension. Now that that's loose, you can loosen the set screw. If you forget to do that, as soon as you loosen the set screw, you'll unwind the tension too. Might as well take the set screw out. This set screw has a special point on it. Um, it's meant to dig into the, um, the spring housing. Uh, it's got little neural or little teeth around the, uh, the cup or the point may be able to see that. Uh, that digs into the housing and um, doesn't allow it to rotate. Now this, I explained earlier, has a special point on it. It's that, it's that dog point. Don't mix these up. If you put the neural point in where the dog point belongs on the quill, you'll scratch the top of the quill. Put this dog point in on the stop it won't hold the position on your depth stop on your spring housing. So these are important to keep separate uh, and put them in the right place when you get, uh, get to putting them all back together again. There's a sleeve on the inside, see it coming out here, that comes off, save that, you're going to use it, and that'll help loosen up the quill housing. There it goes, came right out. Remember the washer, that goes uh, on to squeeze the ears. I just like to put everything back together to keep it contained. Uh, even though you're not going to use the center shaft anymore, you're going to use the locks, the spacer, the handle, the depth stop, the washers on your new one. Now, now is the best time to clean this headstock inside and out. Use um, as simple as soap and water, or if you've got a lot of oily buildup on the inside, you um, may need a solvent. Mineral spirits uh, is probably the best. A little soap and water uh, after the, 
that to clean up uh, any residue left over. So I'm going to take that and head to the sink. All right, now that it's all cleaned and the machining is done, drilled the mounting holes for the motor, for the power supply, and for the new thermal overload protector and fuse. First thing we're going to do is put the quill return, quill feed pinion shaft back in. Here's the old one, old parts. Here's the new one. You can see it's about an inch and a half longer. And with that is a new spacer, um, or an additional spacer. We're going to use both spacers. So take the old parts off. I like to set them in order to come off. Got first serrated washer, the depth stop dial, second serrated washer, and the flat washer. Then the quill lock, the spring washer, wave washer. Uh, newer machines may have three or four of these thin ones that stack together, equal this thickness. Um, and we've got the sleeve. Some of these sleeves um, will not have a keyway in them. Um, we had to do that for uh, a short period of time. If it doesn't have it, it doesn't need it. And with those, you won't have a key right here. Then the spherical washer. This has, uh, it was machined out of a solid piece of metal at one time. Most of them are stamped like this one. Um, more recently, they're wave washers like this, only larger. The, uh, the cup of the spherical washer always goes in towards the ears on the headstock. So this is now uh, no longer usable and belongs in the trash. The new one looks very similar. Um, put the flat washer on first. The serrated washer goes on with the serrations up towards the depth dial. Make sure that the tab on the depth dial will contact the tab on the spring housing. That's a noise you're all familiar with. Then the second serrated washer goes on with the serrations towards the depth dial and the lock. If this seems a little tight, it'll work in. Just a drop of oil on the threads will help that to happen. The other side goes together the same way. Now the spherical washer goes with the cup side in towards the ears inside the headstock. These are the ears I'm referring to. They're what clamps the, uh, the quill in place. And this washer goes right over there. I'm used to putting this together right side up. I hook the spherical washer on the end, the little groove for the quill feed. I like to put a finger through and catch the end of that shaft. And that, if I knock the spherical washer one way or the other, it keeps it from falling off the shaft. Like it did right there, almost. is in the right spot. Make sure your 
mark is up even with the such screw hole for your depth dial and then I'm just using my thumb to pull it to pull it home. Now the old spacer goes on. Rotate it so it slips over the key. I'm holding with my left hand over here. Goes on after the spacer. There's no key to line up here. And the lock goes on. It may seem a little tight, but that'll, that'll work in very quickly. So now it's time for the set screw. Remember, this is the one with the serrated cut point right there. Goes in the top of the headstock, right above the dial. Tighten that down hand tight, not just wrist tight. We don't have to put a lot of elbow into it. If you start deforming the quill housing, then it'll be difficult to turn the, the shaft for tensioning the spring, and you'll have difficulty with quill return. It does need to be tight enough to hold it in place. Now, a word of caution. If you, if you tension this the wrong direction, it'll do two things. First of all, the spring will probably come disconnected inside here. And um, it's, a, it's a very tricky operation to reconnect it. We use special tools to hook that spring and get it over the rivet. So you probably have to send it back into us. If it doesn't come disconnected and you tension it the wrong way, as soon as you relieve the, uh, loosen the lock, it'll shoot the quill out instead of pull it in. So don't want to do it the wrong direction. Uh, I put my finger on the pinion gear inside. That way I can feel which way it's turning. I want to turn it this direction. So that it's pushing against my finger. And then it would draw the quill back in. There's three revolutions. And I don't want to put the quill in quite yet. I'm going to set the depth at four and a quarter and lock that down. That's secured in there. The tension is correct direction to pull the quill in. So the next thing we're going to do are all the electrical connections. Let me get those. Now we're going to be working inside the headstock, upside down in the motor pan. I want to show you first what the plan. The next step is wiring your headstock. Uh, we've got the switch, thermal overload protector, fuse holder with fuse, and four wires in the kit will connect to the power supply and this is your power cord coming into your switch. The black and white wires come into the center terminal of the switch. It works the same way on the newer switch. Then your small black wires have two different terminals on the end. This short black wire has quarter inch terminals on both ends. This other short black wire has quarter inch terminal on one end and 3 16 terminal on the other end. Then this longer black wire has a male terminal, quarter inch in size that connects to your 
power supply and a 3 16 terminal female that connects to the fuse holder. The white wire connects to the white side of the switch and then goes directly to the power supply. Um, there's important thing to note on the overload protector. One side is pretty much blank. The other side has writing on it. The most important information right now is two words. This one says load, this one says line. That corresponds to which terminals get connected to what. Load gets connected eventually to the power supply. Line gets connected to the power cord. So we'll go from the black switch connection to the line side of the thermal overload protector. They snap together nicely. Then from the load side of the overload protector to the fuse then from the side of the fuse to the power supply. Make sure these all connect securely and that your terminals fit together properly. They'll snap together. Now this white wire goes on the side of the white wire from your power cord and then that will go to the white wire on your power supply. Just like that. The off position of your switch is important. It's when it's in the off position it points towards these two end terminals it does the same thing on the old switch, the old toggle switch. When it's down in the off position, it points to the end terminals. So I'm turning the switch this direction inside the headstock. Sometimes you can feel the threads engage and just clicks. Now I can feel which way the terminals are facing. Almost locked down. I can't get a lot of torque on this uh, needle nose pliers, but I can turn the switch inside and get that pretty tight. So we're in the off position. The terminals are facing up. Now let's start putting it together. Start with the fuse holder, take the nut off, the white washer, and we'll use the white washer on the inside that cushions the nut a little bit against the curved casting. And then thread the nut on. You can tighten the nut one of two ways, either with the 5 8 open end wrench. I have to hold the fuse holder on the inside, or you can use my favorite curved needle nose pliers. Next is the overload protector. Remember, we've got a side that has words on it and a side that's nearly blank. 
the important words are line and load. So we're gonna put that up so we can see it and thread the neural nut on from the outside. And now I like to use the leverage of the body here to tighten this. So I've got it set at an angle and then I can turn this with the nut up against the casting and that tightens everything down. So here is the word that says line and here's the word that says load. The first wires I'm going to hook up are the power cord. I've got the wires twisted together and they go under the pinion shaft onto the top two terminals. I like white on right. It rhymes. I remember it that way. To my view, it's the white is on the right. And then the that designates this side of the switch is white, this side of the switch is black. Now I'm going to use short black wire with quarter inch terminal on both ends. And that'll go one on the switch and one on the side that says line. That's over here. Now, the next short black wire has a 3 16 terminal on one end, quarter inch on the other, and that one goes on load. So that'll go on this side, and then it'll go over to the side terminal on the fuse. I'm pushing back the insulator just a little bit so I can get to the side terminal and make sure that it's plugged in completely. Now, this last remaining terminal gets the last black wire, 3 16 female terminal on this side and quarter inch male terminal on the other end. That'll plug into the end of the fuse holder and this will go to your power supply Now the white wire that's remaining goes to the switch on the white side and that will go to your power supply. Depending on your model, your, um, your wire retainer will either mount inside the headstock here or on the newer headstocks with a newer switch it has a center mount uh, right under the control panel. I'm going to slide that. These three holes line up with the three holes in your casting that your old speed control came out of. They're already threaded for 1024 screw. So you just need your Phillips screwdriver. It should thread in pretty easily. If they don't, you're maybe cross threading them a little bit. And if, if that happens, just back the screw up, just loosen it, and you can feel it drop into the threads, and that should line everything up. And tighten that down. Your wire from the power supply will go through this hole and connect to the back of the new control panel. In your hardware pack, 
you should find small 1024 hex nut and two of these white wire clips. We're going to use one of them right now. This wire clip is on the bottom screw as we're looking at it and then the nut holds it in place. And your list is a 3 8 inch open end wrench. And we'll use it to tighten that nut. That holds that wire clip in place. You should need, there it goes, everything's tight. And what that does, we put the black wire from the thermal overload protector through that. And then the white wire goes through in the same direction. We'll connect those up to the uh, power supply here in a little bit. All the electrical connections have been made. The switch is connected to the fuse, thermal overload protector. The wires are ready to connect to the power supply. We need to now assemble the top end of the headstock. There's the fuse, there's the thermal overload protector, and your switch is also installed. What we're going to do is put together the quill and dry sleeve assembly, then the idler shaft. So the first thing to go in, probably the easiest thing, is the quill. It'll slide in until it hits the pinion shaft inside that we installed earlier. We're going to need the quill handle. Now, there's the set screw we took out rides in this groove you'll look down the hole and see that groove and line things up but in order to do that it can't be tight so we'll loosen the depth stop and the quill will engage in the pinion gear inside and then when it gets within a couple inches of being all the way in Set the depth stop to maximum. That'll keep it from coming in any further. And the quill housing can still be rotated. You're gonna need that set screw with the dog point on it. Line up the groove for the top of the quill with the hole. And then drive the set screw down, just barely finger tight. like so. Now you loosen it one eighth of a revolution. The tip of the set screw is still in the groove, but now when you loosen the depth stop, the quill will slide freely through the full range of motion. Now extend the quill just slightly, lock that down again. <clears throat> you need to put the belt in. You got new Best Torque brand belts. These are, are a new technology of belts. They have very good grip. You'll feel how um, rubbery they are on the bottom. I'm not going to call them sticky because it's not really sticky, but it's, it's a nice feeling belt. Because of the uh, properties of this belt, 
we don't need near as much belt tension as we used to. Uh, so make sure that that belt's in place first because it's terrible to have to go through all this again, take it apart uh, just because you forgot the belt. That belt will ride in these grooves here. Um, your drive sleeve assembly comes with a nylon drive on it. You'll see a green mark on it. We use that for alignment here in-house. Make sure there's no dust or anything on it. Now, if you've um, had to use the heat gun on this area of the headstock to expand the uh, bearing journals for removal, you'll have to do it again for uh, installation. This one is in nice shape. It fits uh, right in. Make sure you get the, the splines lined up. They're gonna be a little tight because they're brand new. Slide that bearing in. You should be able to just tap it with your hand to get it to, to seat all the way. If you have to heat up these journals using your heat gun, do it without the bearings in place. You may need to even put the bearing, uh, the drive sleeve assembly in the freezer overnight. That'll shrink the bearings as much as possible. The heat gun will expand the casting as much as possible and you'll be able to slide it together just like that. Now this, um, this belt's in place, we'll adjust it in a minute. Last thing we need is this spiral snap ring that we took out in the very beginning. Notice this has an S shape to it or, or wa wave to it. Uh, that fills the, uh, fills the groove, expands up and pushes against the face of the bearing. You can kind of see where your screwdriver has done its deeds, taking it apart. I like to put it back together the same way it came apart. Separate the layers, try to get the first end started in the groove and push it down and around as you go. You can get that, that whole snap ring into, into the grooves all the way around the two circles that it takes. I like the final end to be up here at the top. And before you push it in, you can just slide that around. We do this in production, just so we know where that, that starting end is if you ever have to take it apart, it'll be right up at the top. So you hear that snapped in there just nice. I can use my thumbnail and compress the, the S's and get most of this to go in place. And if you don't get it all in place, use a wide flat blade screwdriver with some finesse and just push down on the S's, the spring tension of that snap ring will do its job and push it out, expanding into the groove. Be very careful you don't slip off and jam the screwdriver into the shield here. That, could, that will do some damage to the shield and will damage the bearing. It'll make it run noisy and hot and you'll have to call us for a replacement very soon. So your belt's in place, your drive sleeve assembly's in place. Keep the power cord coming out in one of the corners so that you don't pinch it. Uh, this belt <coughs> needs to be positioned uh, so that you see two grooves right here. This is the same for all generations of headstocks. <clears throat> and if, um, if it happens to slide around a little bit during the final assembly, we can adjust that later. So the, the top end is assembled, snap rings in, the quill moves and returns nicely. 
Now we're going to put in the idler shaft that comes with the eccentric bushing on the idler shaft bearings. You'll notice the old one you took out probably doesn't look like this. It has the standard sheave shaft out here and has a solid water pump bearing instead of these two bearings here. Uh, the manufacturer has quit making a water pump bearing. We cannot get those anymore, so we changed to these two high-speed bearings. This shaft runs at 1.6 times the top shaft, uh, so that the joiner is running at the proper speed at the same time the saw is running at the proper speed. So that means that this shaft can run at 16,000 RPM when the top shaft is running at 10,000. These are specially made bearings for us to take that high, uh, high speed and high temperature. This shaft may get hot to the touch. Uh, that's normal. You can, uh, you will be able to feel heat in this shaft, uh, especially if you're running at the higher speeds, you'll feel that heat very quickly. Just be aware of that. Don't let it concern you. Now to put this together, we need to work from both sides at the same time. The best way to show you this, I think, is from this angle. The idler shaft goes in and the, the belt goes over the inside part of the pulley, right here where I've got it. Now, I always like to look down below and see if the belts where it belongs with two grooves showing, it looks like it is. And now it's on in the proper grooves. There's only one place for each belt to go. There's nine grooves and nine grooves. The belt is nine grooves wide. Now you'll have a little hex screw here. That's a stop. And you'll be able to slide on, put the, put the, the slot down so that you've got most amount of adjustment possible. Slide that onto your bearing and start it into the casting and lift up on the idler shaft as you slide it together. Just made sure that the belt's on the right, uh, right groove down here on the drive sleeve assembly. I'm going to take the slot screwdriver and rotate the shaft clockwise, looking at it from this direction. And that adds some tension on the belt. You can still see that I can flex it a little bit. And that's, that's about the right tension. Just a, a bit of a bit of a flex there. Next you need your bolt and nut, depending on the vintage, the bolt will look differently. Since the early 70s we've used this bolt, the nuts changed from the square one we first used to a hex one. The early uh, a headstocks, some of the B headstocks, the gold one, for example, will have a smaller Allen screw that you need the 532nd Allen wrench in. This one takes the larger quarter inch Allen wrench. Turn it around so you can see what I'm doing. This bolt goes through from here and your nut sits in the recess here. The lock washer is against the head of the screw. I just give it a little finger tight. 
we'll adjust it uh, for final position later with the motor on it. So we've got all the uh, shafting components, the first belt, the quill, the drive sleeve assembly assembled in addition to the electrical components. Next will be the power supply to go in here and finally the wedge locks. Now it's time to put in the power supply. We're going to use these holes that you drilled here and here. See them on the side there, plus these two holes drilled right here. Those four holes hold the power supply in place inside your headstock. Power supply looks like this. And we use Tinnerman nuts or Tinnerman clips on these tabs. Now, speaking of Tinnerman clips, we have two different types in your upgrade package. We have this J-clip. We call it a J-clip because it looks like a J or backwards J. And we have these U-clips which look like a U either way. Now the U U clips are made for the sheet metal power supply. The J clips have a wider opening and work well on the thicker cast surfaces like this. Now um, we realize that you all have uh, at least the equal to these J clips on your uh, headstocks, uh, but we just want to make sure in case some of them get lost or broken or rusted with age that you can put your headstock back together without calling us for uh, additional parts. Now on the power supply, the U-clips go on and they should hold directly onto the sheet metal. Make sure that the bent or nut end is on the inside towards the power supply. That way the screw that goes through it and we give you the, the screws in your kit the screw goes through the clearance hole, threads into the back side of the clip. So that, that side there goes on the inside. Some of the clips may seem a little loose on the sheet metal tabs. That's easy enough to fix pair of slip jaw pliers. These all seem pretty good. I expect you'll get good ones, but you can put it in the center portion of the plier where you get the most, uh, most leverage and just squeeze down on that a little bit and that'll bring the two faces together so that it'll clamp onto the under the sheet metal. That'll just make your life easier when you go to install everything. These won't be falling off. Gravity won't be fighting you. Now, the power supply is going to go in the headstock here. I'm going to put the wire clip 
on the wire to begin with. It's it's pretty stiff clip, and some people have strong enough hands to get that wire clip over the wire. I need a little help from the needle nose pliers. Now that's going to be right here using the same hole as the power supply is mounted to. These two wires are used when we assemble the motor. This wire with the six pins large white plug is used to connect to the motor, provides the power from power supply to the motor. This wire connects to the speed sensor in the motor. These two wires, we this flat wire here is used for the control panel and that'll go through this rubber grommet right here. And this black and white wire connects to these black and white wires inside here. That's the first thing we'll do. It almost seems like you need three hands to do this, but if you rest the power supply in your headstock like so, you can bring one hand through the access opening. Make sure to connect black to black. And if you need a little more room, you can disconnect the wire from the terminal, from the wire retainer. And that gives you more room to connect white wire to white. There's white wire to white, black wire to black, black wire to black, and then hook those back into the connector. Now I see I pulled the wire off of the, I pulled the wire off of the thermal overload protector. Be careful with that. And then this wire goes through this hole right here, the rubber grommet. For the new touch screen control panel. I want to turn this around so that you can see what I'm doing right here. This is the next connection. It's going to be your first retaining screws on the power supply will hold the wire clip and I do that first because there's most going on there put the screw through the wire clip wire retainer first and then you can lift up the power supply to line it up with the screw and my hands blocking what I'm trying to show you and I'm turning the screw by hand to get it started and then the screwdriver will take it home you can see it coming through right here.
I've got it mostly tight. Next screw. We'll go through the other tenement clip. Give it a little wiggle and it moves the tenement clip over in place. Now I haven't tightened these down all the way because I want to be able to adjust for these screws. You see the screw going in the side right here and through the tenement clip. The last one's always the most difficult one. I've got this little oh, punch, small iron wrench will work. Help me move that tin clip over where it belongs. There it goes. And you can see the screw beginning to come through. Tighten it down. Almost all the way. Now these two screws I want to tighten first all the way home. First the one with the wire retainer. Then the second one on this end. Got plenty of wire sticking out here for the control panel. We'll tighten this screw. And then the second screw. So now your power supply is completely installed. Next will be the wedge locks. The wedge locks will be slightly different then the way you took them out. First notice about an inch from the inside, the width of my thumb, from the wedge to the end of the threads here in the middle. You're gonna to wanna to put the wedge back in the same spot. You've got two flat washers right here. They have a sharp edge on one face and a rounded edge on the other face. These washers are used to prevent the uh, cable protector from getting inside the wedges and jamming up. So I like to put the sharp edge away from the wedge lock or the round edge towards the wedge lock. The other one goes on the same way the round edge will be towards the wedge lock. Make sure these go on the right direction. Just have to take off this one. Screw it down until there's about an inch or a thumb width, the thread showing, and then it should go together just fine. Now remember this is left hand threads here, so you have to loosen it backwards, so to speak. That comes off. 
Now make sure that this ed end with the pin this goes on the front side here with the speed control. Turn your wedges so that the flat face is down. It gives more room to the power supply. And then I push this wedge into its seat and begin turning what is sticking out. That moves both wedges outward and into their home position. Both at the same time when you get most of it done you can thread it from the inside or where the knob goes. Now, right now, I've got the wedges turned up. That's for the clearance on the weight tubes. The washers are against the wedges. Looks like I've got about four or five threads in there. That's probably too much. So I'm going to loosen these a little bit so I can see just two threads and then I'll turn this wedge so that it reduces clearance inside here. Back it up so that there's about uh, an eighth to two sixteenths clearance here. Should be enough room to put the knob on. Again, I'm tightening backwards. Now I bottomed out. Uh, in the threads, the holes line up. I can prove that by putting my pin punch all the way through. It keeps things aligned. You're going to need your pin that came out of there and if you turn this wedge so that it actually goes up against the knob here that kind of locks things together and makes it a little more rigid a little more stable you should be able to see a side that's a little flatter from hammer blows that one should be the the top to take more hammer blows. Just enough to start it. Then you can use the pin punch on top and drive the pin home. flush with that side and a little bit sub flush there just like it was to begin with. Got two threads sh showing in there. In other words the end of the rod leaves Two threads visible. I've got just a little bit of play here. The wedge is locked up against the knob. Last thing to put on is the wire protector. It's just a coil of plastic and all you have to do is uncoil one end, hook it over the rod, and just begin to rotate it, and it, and it threads itself right on 
the wedge lock rod. Covering those threads and protecting the wires from those threads. Now you can see this is, it's a little loose. It'll slide back and forth. And that's good because the washers and the wedges also move. And you can see the washers are close fit and they will keep the thread protector on the, um, on the threaded lock rod and out of the wedges. So the next thing we'll do is put a, this part of the headstock back on your mark. A couple of things I want to mention before going further have to do with this lock on both the A headstock and this B headstock. First on the A headstock, you got this bearing keeper. This goes in, the bolt goes through this hole. This goes in with the wide, large side out. Otherwise, it will not fit in the, uh, this large side will not fit in the space between the eccentric and the pulley. So this goes in this way, the bolt goes through it and put on the nut just like you put it apart. On these B headstocks, and C headstocks for that matter, after you put the appropriate nut together, you need to install this screw and washer combination in the hole right here in this uh, alignment is below the idler shaft. Your Phillips screwdriver will drive this guy in place unless it has a slot screw like this one. So this acts like a stop to hold, to keep the eccentric from sliding out. This acts as a stop to keep the bearings from sliding out of the eccentric. Now push the washer up to get it in full engagement with the eccentric. Good and tight. Then that's complete, has been fully assembled for either the A, B, and C headstocks. Now the last thing we can do before putting the headstock back on the way tubes is installing these tenement clips. Now this is the old U-clip that was the original, and I told you about the new J-clip. They can be used interchangeably, but if your old U-clips are in good shape, they go on just like they came off. Line the holes up and put the inside where the deformed hole is uh, for the threads, it goes on the inside. Now they're different thicknesses of casting and it looks like these, hopefully yours, will be adjusted for those different thicknesses. And the adjustment will help to overcome gravity. Now I've got one loose one right here. As I showed you earlier, we take the pliers, squeeze it down. on 
down there. Over it goes. Make sure that that curved protruding surface that catches the threads is on the inside. These are all tight and they'll stay there during the final assembly. There's two more that you shouldn't have to remove and if they're adjusted properly, they'll stay there. One right here, one right here. Those are for the belt cover. All right, finally, we're ready to put this headstock back on the weight tubes. Goes on a lot like it came off. We'll put the motor pan there just for place holding. Here on the wedge locks, Make sure that those are rotated so that it creates a nice ramp for the weight tubes to slide over them. If they're tilted back, like I had them just now, just have to rotate them forward so that the weight tubes will slide in this way. Your wires will be out of the way. This will be relatively light because it doesn't have the motor in it. See the alignment perfectly. Slide it right down the tubes. Lock the wedge lock. The, yeah, the setup is correct when there's about an eighth of an inch gap right here. And the threads are flush to one thread deep in the back and everything's locked. Your new control panel will go on here. We'll wait to the very end to do that. And we'll put the motor on next. The motor goes on a little bit differently than it came off. Instead of bolting to the motor pan and sitting down here, these motor mounts will bolt directly to the headstock, these three holes front and back that you drilled previously. So to do that, we're going to turn things around, stand it up in the drill press position, and uh, use the table as a motor support behind the headstock. Don't need the plywood in the boards anymore. Be sure to lock this. The table comes out. Before you take it all the way out, loosen the tilt lock. Go ahead and stop. Turn it horizontal. Then you can take the table all the way out and put it in for the back side. I'm going to raise this up a little bit. I want the wire to be completely out of the way. Motor pin can sit where it is. And the table goes all the way in. You're going to need this last block of wood, we call it stage. It will support the motor and hold it in position uh, relative to the headstock. So I'm going to put the motor on a stage like that. Just about the time the motor or the headstock hits the bumper, it will align with these mounting holes.
Now, if your motor mounts don't go inside the first time, there's a little clearance in the holes where these bolts go. And you just need your 13 millimeter open end wrench. And just loosen the bottom bolt enough so things will shift. And now, just let this drop a little bit. There, the screw holes line up perfectly. We're just going to put in the first screw right here after we make connections. All right, now we're going to connect some wires. But before we do, I'm going to coil these up just to make them a little bit more manageable. That's what these zip ties are for. one would get coiled right next to the plug. The plug right next to the string relief. That seems to be the, the best solution right there. And then we can connect the ground wire right next to the ground terminal or the ground symbol. Using a nut driver or a slot screwdriver. Keep that motor on the stage. connect the speed sensor wire you can see a little notch right there and probably see that tab right there above my finger just go together and it clicks the large plug has d-shaped holes and round holes the mating plug has the same pin arrangement. So those have to go together to match. Everything lines up, squeeze it together and it clicks. Now this will go all down. Now a little trick here is I take a, just a tad bit of paste wax, put it on my screw That helps that thread in there with fingertip control. I already put the one on the back side. Just screw that in just enough um, so that it acts as a good pivot. And we'll be able to put the belt on next. This is another one of these best torque belts. Now leave the stage where it is and just pivot that motor up like this. Slip the belt over the motor onto the pulley. Now we've got these motors pretty well set for belt tension. And alignment. Get everything on the right pulleys. 
Right now it seems pretty loose, but right here we don't have these screws in yet. So there, I tighten it up some. Now, leave the stage underneath here so that it supports the weight and doesn't drop the motor. There. We've got alignment pretty much. And again, a little bit of paste wax on the screw. And it'll go right in. I'll finish up the screws on the other four holes and be right back. Turn in that last screw. You see the motor mount flexing just a little bit. The casting flexes a little bit. That's pretty normal. I'm going to line that back up and that. Check the ones on the other side just to make sure. Now this belt is a little bit loose. So I'll show you real quick how to adjust the belt tension using this 13 millimeter wrench. Now I'm going to loosen these end nuts. One half, one third. I've got about one thread sticking out on both of them. I'll do the same thing on this side. And with all the nuts at equal place, the when you bring the motor out using these inside nuts, it should keep everything level. Give that a turn, just snug that up, snug that up. Same thing over here. And finally, the nut on the bottom here. And that is a little more tension. I think I'm going to do that again just to. We'll make the nuts flush with the end again to keep them keep the motor parallel the belts parallel with the belts and the pulleys hand there that's better to illustrate the firmness of the belt I push it on the side it flexes a little but that's all right it's not slack in any way it's just firm you can see an eighth inch gap between the two belts right here. And then when you put the straight edge across, it goes right in the center of that eighth inch gap, sitting right on the, the pulley. So that's perfect belt alignment. Now that the Power Pro is all put together, you've got the new touch screen on for generation two. We can plug it in 
the belts are installed, the motor's installed, everything's aligned. Now, to turn it on, it's simple, just like before. You see the logo, a few cautions. And this is the home screen. Right now I've got this uh, system locked. Uh, I'm gonna unlock it, use the, press the lock button. It asks for a password. This password is the same password you can use to override your password if you, um, if you forget it um, or somebody else changes it uh, without you knowing it. So the magic password is 7467 and confirm. That's the normal home screen. It has all the different icons for the different operations uh, for the Shopsmith system from sanding to drilling to turning, joiner, sawing, routing, shaping uh, from slow to fast. We're not going to get into those right now. They're explained in your owner's manual. Uh, what we're going to do is quick start. Um, the default is 500 RPM. Um, we'll start it there just to see how it sounds. Sounds pretty good. Nice and slow, steady. Now we use the back button to go back to that screen. Change it to 1350, start. Okay, sounds pretty good. Go back, we'll go up to 2000. Now, when you hit the start button, you'll have a high speed warning over 1500 RPM. That's because some of our machines um, don't like to run over 1500, it's unsafe. Um, they'll even uh, break apart and damage themselves at those at higher speeds. So if you accidentally go over 1500 RPM, you can cancel it, go back to the quick start menu, change the speed if you want to. Um, and we're gonna go again at 2000 RPM. We will confirm it this time and then start. That starts at 2000 RPM. If you start again at 2000 RPM, you're not going to have to answer those questions because you've already answered them once for this setup. Um, so 2000 RPM sounds pretty good. Singing right along. And we'll go back to the quick start menu. Go up to 3450. Again, we change the speed, so we have to answer the question again. Confirm, start. Here we are at 3450, that's about halfway in the middle of the speed range, maybe a third. Uh, it's a good place to start setting and balancing the belt tension, so we'll accomplish that next. Uh, what we're going to do next is put the motor pan on. You're going to need the screws that came off of it. Um, this appropriate screwdriver and we'll put the strain relief on after the motor pan goes on. So that's gone blank. Unplug the power cord and slip this into place. Make sure that your tenement clips are aligned all the way around. It's really frustrating when you get the to put the last screw in and the tenement clips down in the right spot. And I like to put these closed corners in first, both front and back. That just sets the motor pan in the right position. I'm just threading them in with my fingers. Now this is a good tight fit, just like it should be. Uh, 
Now the other side, I'll have to push the motor pan in just a little bit. But it's flexible in that direction. Alright, the last thing on the motor pan is to put a strain relief on the power cord. Strain relief is this plastic piece, two pieces held together with a connector. You've got tongues on the small side that go into the grooves on the large side. Just like that. And that squeezes together. The power cord goes up and down inside and then it will never pull out of the, um, of the motor pan. This uh, gets squeezed together with your pliers. Start as close to the motor pan as you can and get that little connector inside the motor pan while you put the two halves together. And then I, I'm pushing with my thumb to slide this in as far as it will go before I put the pliers on. My pliers will compress it and then it'll go in the hole with a little bit of effort. Almost done. Yeah, that did it. So that'll never come out until you grab a pair of pliers and squeeze it again. All right, we're getting very close to being done. Just need to put the belt cover on. Put the way tube tie bar on. We've got three screws left. Two for the belt cover here, and one for the other side of the motor here. Let's put the back one on first. Around to the front side. Tube, tube tie bar just drops on from the top and tighten two set screws, one on each way tube. The last thing to do is to clear the table. Move the table out, disengage it from the carriage. And lay the machine down. Place your vertical lock knob. And tighten your headrest. Now you've got one screw left, and that goes right here in the front of the motor pan. Now all the hardware is attached. Your headstock slides well. It's a little bit heavier than it was before. Uh, the last thing to do is two new labels. One general warning label for the Gen 2 touchscreen, and then a new speed chart label right here for the uh, new speed settings that's built into this. One thing on the speed charts, the Goldie, has a permanent label right here where the speed chart will go. So on your belt cover, we start at the very top up here with the speed chart, and then your warning labels go directly below it and cascade down over the way too.
So we'll clean the headstock next for the labels. I have denatured alcohol, clean rag, and the new labels. The first new label is just about the same size as the old label. These are the new warnings. And the second label is your speed chart label that matches the speeds uh, in your quick start menu. And that'll go right here next to the switch. And it wraps around the top of the headstock. The bottom is right here, even with the uh, quill lock. So let's clean this area first. Now it kind of depends on what you've done regarding the old labels as to how much cleaning you have to do. I'm just using denatured alcohol that takes off any oily residue, some of the stickiness from past labels. Um, but you can see a little bit of the dirt. The some of the old labels have quite aggressive glue on them. And you may need to use other commercial sticky removers, for lack of a better term. Um, acetone works well, uh, depending on the vintage of your machine, lacquer thinner will eat the paint. So test that in a inconspicuous area. Um, but denatured alcohol is a good uh, fall back. Just peel off the backing. Line things up. Now the reference points on this one are the edge of the switch, no matter which headstock you've got. The top of the quill lock and then just roll it over the top. That looks pretty good. Now this one, because it's a little longer, takes a little more finesse. Since I'm putting it over the old label, that's my guide at the top and then use the edge of the old label to guide the new label down, peeling the back away as you go. Try to avoid wrinkles. Now your serial number and date code for your new upgrade will go right here in that square. Now that you've completed all the steps in the upgrade for your PowerPro headstock Gen 2 touchscreen, you're ready to start woodworking again and enjoy all the benefits. Remember to read, understand, and follow all the instructions in your owner's manual. And it's time to get back to woodworking. Have a great day.